you know, Ray, I've, I've gotten to a place where I'm so good at this that there's just vendors lining up to... <laughs> That's, we like to, to, we to, like that to solicit to solicit business. Welcome into the Ben Burnett Show, an app and media podcast. I want to thank Wendell Strickland and Strongside Solutions for jumping on as a sponsor with us. Uh, we we would be nowhere without the people who make this thing run, and so. Wendell and Grant, if you're a uh, mid, small to mid-sized business looking to restructure the way that you do healthcare, I encourage you to go to StrongSideSolutions.com. My guest today is somebody that many people in North Fulton and Alpharetta are familiar with, and it's Ray Appen. Ray, welcome in. Hey, thank you, Ben. It's, I'm it's, excited. It's very strange <laughs> to, to welcome to an Appen into as a guest to an <laughs> Appen Media podcast. It's a bit excited. It's a bit strange to be on this side of the table. Uh, yeah. So my my first introduction to you was on Inside the Box when you talked about how you got into what you've seen change, how you got into media what drew you to you know community newspapers talk talk a little bit about that about your your time in in florida through school how you got interested in the news and and how that came to be uh what you what your life's goal and life's passion was okay i'll i'll try to boil down a long story into a short digestible piece so i was went to fsu uh stayed in school an awful long time how many years? Uh, probably off and on for a dozen. For, for a four-year degree? Uh, for mul- um, sort of multiple. I got an undergrad. I got a grad degree. Okay. Almost a couple well, of undergrad degrees. If you were going to go 12 years for a four-year degree, I was going to learn a lot more about <laughs> you in just two sentences. Yeah. No, I, I, a long time ago, I, you know, I, I saw that being in school and learning and Living on a campus was probably not a bad life. No, it's not. And um, <laughs> so I was no, I was never in a hurry to leave. I had been in school for a long time. I'd never really. I was working. For, I was running a dorm, so they paid me. Uh, they paid for my tuition. They gave me a small stipend. Had room and board. So it just had been a long time. Uh, Finally, I felt guilty. Some companies were interviewing on campus. So I, I, I just went and interviewed with two. One was, um, uh, I think, Johnson & Johnson. And halfway through the interview, we looked at each other and we both said, mm, this is not going to be it This is me. not going to work. And it was, it was good. You know, we both knew it. So, um, but then Miami Herald was there. And I, at the time, I was trying to moved to South America, um, to Brazil. Uh, I sort of saw it as the last frontier (laughs) and, you know, it was, I mean, there were, there were people, there were gold, there was a gold rush down there. There was a guy named Ludwig who was, um, floating up the Amazon, um, with a, a, a floating pulp mill. I mean, it was, it was the last of the wild west. And so, I figured, you know what, I'll interview for the Miami Herald. A lot of multinationals are based out of uh, Miami, where they were at that yes. time. And um, and they <laughs> offered me a job, which really caught me off guard. Um, and I moved to Miami, and I really was – I loved lit, literature, English. So I read a lot. I, I – was a you know one course short of a literature degree. So you like to read. So I like to read, and you know going to Miami Herald was I wasn't specifically interested in journalism or newspapers. Being interested in Miami is easy. Yeah, yeah. That, My, Miami's awesome. It's and, and awesome. It, we we miss Miami. We Christine and I used to go back every three or four years and and just to get our Miami fix again. Where did you uh, Where did you live when you were down there? We, yeah, we had a, we had, it was tough. Um, we lived out on Key Biscayne. Yeah, that's uh, rough, man. <laughs> about half the time. Um, Coral Gables, the other half. So yeah, you're really struggling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we loved it. We, we caught the Miami Herald at the, the last vestiges of when owning, when owning a newspaper was like printing money. Um, uh, it was, 
it was a really rock and roll town. Um, the Herald was this giant patriarch in Miami where they they would um, help good things happen. They would bust bad cops. They would um, do incredible things because they were making so much money. So I, I caught it at a really good time. Um, met Christina down there. Um, we got married. I uh, worked for the Herald for about eight years, mostly on the advertising side, uh, was not on the news side. There was a separation um, at that time where you almost, if you were in the, on the business side, you were almost barred. Vil vilified? Yeah, you you did not go up to you the do newsroom. Not, you do not touch that newsroom. Yeah, you don't even talk to, to <laughs> It's reporters. the capitalism we don't talk about at the, yeah. in the newspaper industry. That's yep. funny. Well, when you... At some point, you obviously got in, interested in the idea of community newspapers. Well, what happened was I had gone about as far as I could go in Miami. Um, I did well. I got a lot, you know, did a lot of jobs, but I was pretty much capped out. And I started looking for another job. I ended up finding one in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, it was a big job. Um my timing was not great. It was, I went to work for the Suburban Journals, which was a kind of similar to the neighbor newspaper. It was a chain of about 35 weekly newspapers, combined circulation, um, about 800,000. And I went there as their classified director. Um, and at the time, a guy named Ralph Ingersoll owned the Suburban Journals, and he was trying to start the St. Louis Sun, which was the first big daily startup since 1945 in the, in the United States. And he had bond money, was, I oh, think, wow. backed by Michael Milken, Milliken. Yep. And this was right before the big, one of the big crashes. And um, so I went to work in, in St. Louis, and about six months later, the walls came tumbling down. So one day the my boss came in and laid off. I was one of six directors and we all got fired. Long way from home. Yep. Long I Christina was pregnant. We had Hans and I think she was pregnant with Amelia. And um so I just, you know, called her one day and said, Hey, I don't have a job. And uh at that point, you know, we just said, you know, let's Let's get out of corporate. Let's see if we can find a paper that we can buy. And so that was what were your requirements when you start look when you start looking into the brokerage business of buying a newspaper or overtaking one or whatever the many avenues you can do to acquire a business that, that publishes on a weekly basis. What did you look at? What were you interested in from a family standpoint? What were you interested in from a news standpoint? Did you want a certain circulation? You know, I I was I'm 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 pretty I'm a simpleton. I I just think in really short ideas and concepts. I'm not very complicated. I'm not a big planner. Um, we I wanted and I and Christina felt the same way because we liked the South. So I wanted to stay in the South. Um, I wanted to find a newspaper that was either a suburban paper adjacent to a big metropolitan market, um, or in a big, big metropolitan market, which meant a Charlotte or a Jacksonville or was, a Tampa. Or, I was going to say the Observer you know, or yeah. the AJC, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, you know, I I contacted some brokers and I, I found this, uh, the review advertised for sale, came here and talked to the owner, Melanie Bates, um, looked at the market and, you know, all I knew at, at the time there was – um, Van Gogh's was on Windward. That was the only building on Windward. Um, there were an awful lot of car dealerships. And I knew it was close to Atlanta, so I just said, you know, I, I can sell this. This is close enough. Yeah, yeah. It checked enough of the boxes. So you, when did you really notice the point? It's step, stepping away from the news. When did you notice the point where Alpharetta was changing? What, what, was, what was that? What was that watermark? You know, I don't, I don't think there was a watermark, a watermark per se. Alpharetta, while you know, in back then, 
they were in a in a in a slow mode, and then it's like someone f hit a switch, and we went from second gear to fifth gear in in Alpharetta, and you know, with the exception of a couple of recessions, it it has just been in fifth gear, really since 1990. Um, it just Businesses started moving here. Um, cycles of real estate would, you know, ebb and flow. Um, they started building out Preston Ridge and and all the office office buildings. It just, um, it wasn't something you really I, I really noticed because we were uh, when I bought the paper. It, it, there was a halftime reporter and a. Uh, production person and me. <laughs> so, so you immediately went so, straight into the journalism piece of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was it was just, you know, it's, it was sink or swim, right? Which is not unlike you know, so anyone buying a small business. You, uh, we took our, uh, we had we sold our house in Coral Gables, um, and made some money. So I took all the money I had in the world and and gave it to. <laughs> To Melanie Bates. To somebody, yeah. Uh, yep. And uh, so I had to make it work. And um, Isn't it funny how I, one of the things that I, I think is the theme through the first 15 episodes, I have yet to interview somebody, and I don't know if it's just an interesting quality of person, but every single one of the 15 people that I have spoken with bet on themselves in a pretty radical way. And I think that that is just you had to make it work. Whether or not you're a guy like Cadillac Jack who's lived out here for a long time, he's like, I moved here and started at nights. I knew I wanted to be in a morning show in a top 10 market. He's like, I knew what I wanted to do from the time I was 20 years old. I was, I, I knew I wanted to be on the radio before that. And he's like, I figured it out. You talked to the public safety director. It was like, I knew that I wanted to be the chief of police and that I, you know, wherever you go, the, just the driven nature of the high achieving out people out here is unbelievable. I I I think I agree, and I think you know it's hard to tell if we're different from other places, but I think we probably are. Um, when I think of the people that I know that I've met along the way, from a from a Pin Hodge to a um, so many of these overachievers um, who just dig in, and uh, Chuck Palmer, uh, Palmer Dodge was. I don't think he had been in the car. He'd been a, a car salesman, and I think he was a great car salesman. And his boss, I'm not sure how he got into it, but, I mean, you know, he's he's done fabulous. And, and um, it's just, I think it's a town of entrepreneurs and a town of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. We're, there's a lot of people that move here from some really smart parts of the country, too. Yep. And when you start to see... Uh, you know, McKesson was a, a huge employer from an IT perspective. That's a business that's larger than Verizon. Yep. A and Verizon is somebody everybody knows. Not as, not as many people know McKesson, but they're worth more money. Um, and I think that that aspect of the those Fortune 500 companies that are out here, it, it's they attract some pretty remarkable talent. And there's people that come here from... Silicon Valley, and there's people that come here from Austin, Texas, or Dallas, or Boston, and they stay. And your money goes a little bit farther, and it's expensive. I mean, don't don't make no mistake. It's 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 getting more expensive to live here, but it is also not as expensive as those markets out west. We're I think we're the most affordable metropolitan market. One of the top, one of the most affordable metropolitan markets. If you look at Atlanta as a whole, and and uh, and we're part of that. Um, we're, we've got to be in the top five most affordable markets and maybe the best market for starting a business. I think I'm sure we've probably been named something along those lines. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to ask you, you wrote an article at the end of last year. And one of the, I love the features that you write because it's obvious that you have gotten to a place where you're like, I kind of earned the right to write whatever I want. Uh, <laughs> I, and, and so I, 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 I'll, I'll tease it and I'll, I'll be right back. 
Are you a business owner with over 150 employees? Did you just receive an increase in your health care premiums again this year? When it comes to the cost of health care, there is something that you can do to control costs without sacrificing quality. StrongSide Solutions developed eBenefix, a program that provides the restructuring of the individual parts of the health care delivery system to employers and employees. With over 120 employees, the eBenefix healthcare model saved the city of Villarica over a million dollars in 2018 alone. Restructure your health care, release those trapped ca- costs of capital, and manage your health care expenses the same way you would any other facet of your business. Call my buddy Wendell Strickland today at StrongSide Solutions at 770-4-STRONG or visit them at StrongSideSolutions.com. Man, that was just flawless. Uh, Perfect. Perfect live reads, man. If you, if you, if let me just tell you, this is for free to the uh, entrepreneurial business community. If you want the best reader of ads in the business, call me. <laughs> I mean, I just make it rain for your business. You nailed it. Just nailed, nailed, it. nailed it. And I'm humble. Oh man, I'm so humble. Uh, well, Ray, I want to I want to ask you about something because we are getting to a place in the Alpharetta City Council where. We're starting to wrestle with this from a developer standpoint, from a constituency standpoint, and then from a market standpoint. Because if we don't do something, something is going to be done to us. And it's with respect to the attainable or affordable housing conversation. I'll say I'll say my piece and I'll I'll let you I'll I'll, I'll ask you the same question because it's interesting and there's. I think there's a bunch of decent answers, and I think that there none of them are easy to implement or institute. It's a hard question, and there I don't think there are any easy answers. And so we had a we had a developer that came forward. It's probably a month ago at this point, and he met the code from a density requirement. He met the green space requirement. And his business model, it backs up to what will be a Wellstar very soon on Old Milton Parkway as an outpatient surgery center. And his whole, it, they're small, there are townhouses, but they were small in the 300, you know, mid 300s, low 400s, which we're not going to argue whether or not that's affordable. It's a different conversation. But it was an opportunity for the free market to try to deliver that to nurses, medical professionals was who he was going to sit there and try to market it to. And the conversation was very interesting that took place. The way that they presented it was interesting. And it wound up not working out. And the reason that I kind of sympathized with with the developer a little bit was because if somebody in the in the marketplace can bring me a development with a certain level of density and assure me that young people even though I can't zone that young people or nurses young professionals late 20s early 30s young families can do that i think alpharetta's largest problem is going to be mirrored by the rest of the united states economy and that our population over the course of the next 20 years separate from an immigration conversation is going to get smaller because 2018 was the lowest birth rate in this country in 30 years. And so the people that are able to, the cities and municipalities and counties and states that can address this today are going to be in a much better place a generation from now. And that is my overarching willingness to enter, enter into this attainable housing conversation because we as, as people that live in Alpharetta and in North Fulton are going to be better off when we can stock that pond, if we can keep our elementary school numbers to be marginally lower than they are today, we will be a community that wins in 20 years. And I don't know, that's not a zoning conversation, but it is. It's not a, that, that's not an efficacy of an argument conversation, but it matters. And so how do you convince, and everybody that I serve with on a city council, they're all smart people, and we're all different. And I don't, I think that there are some people that don't care. They want to see, I I don't think, I I have to figure out how to say this, or I'm going to wind up in trouble. But your vast majority of 26-year-old newly married people thinking about starting a family or 29, whatever that is, can't afford an $850,000 house. Yep. 
but your community is better with them in it than they are without it. And so how do you sit there? I, I told you I appreciated the fact I was willing to overlook a few things to allow something of that price point to service a community that would have doctors and not doctors. They can afford to live here or the, su the nurses, support personnel, yeah. the support personnel, the technicians and the nurses, and because I feel like this community is better with them than it is without them. Uh, or you can take, you know, your average Alpharetta police officer, firefighter, you know, if you, you, if you're making $60,000 as a household income, you can afford to live there. And I think that that is it maybe not easily, but you can. And that's the first conversation that we should have, because if we don't have that conversation, we're going to get that conversation forced down our throat by a higher entity at some point. What I, what prompted you to write that article? And you're a really thoughtful guy who I agree with as often as I don't. What prompted you to write that article and where did you write that article coming from? And you can give which, some context which, which to it. Which article are we talking about? The, the article that you wrote about Alpharetta's largest looming problem is affordable housing. Um, to that effect. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a topic that's near, that I feel strongly about. Um, well, what? I'll ask the next question. Why do you feel strongly about that well, topic? Well, I, re I read a lot. I, st I study a lot. Um, I look at trends and the, the macro trend in the country that you referenced is that a smaller and smaller per, um, percentage of the population will be in the workforce. Or, I mean, the, we're, we're gonna, the, the pool of people who are, can and are willing to work is is diminishing and the competition for those for their jobs is is going to do nothing but increase and everything i've read tells me that what's going to happen is that the these young people who are going to be out in the marketplace looking for jobs are going to flock to the cities where that have reached out to them that have made housing affordable that have made um, transportation work that um, that are the best fits for them for what what they can afford and what they're interested in um, and part of that a big part of that is is affordable housing do you when you say affordable housing do you mean for rent for own or both it would have it would have to be both and Really, it's what this conversation is about a lot is density. Mm -hmm. And when when someone uses that word in Alpharetta. They're uh, my voters. A lot of people get really up in arms when you say density because there are a lot of negative um, thoughts about density. Um, but the reality is you... The city, you know, you you can do density and you can um, manage the potential negative aspects of density. Um, it can be done. It is done. And the cities that accept density and and take it on and figure out how to make it work, so it doesn't have so it has an, an acceptable impact on traffic. So. Um, which is a, 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 one of the big um, objections to density is it's, it's going to cause more traffic. Um, you know, people also say, you know, density brings more, more crime because you have a higher percentage of apartments and things like that. But the, at the end of the day, well, you have, you would have a higher percentage of people. So you would have, yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it's it, just it, an economies of scale. Really at the end of the day, I mean, look, Alpharetta has got, um, has managed growth for the last 25 years and they've done a really good job. Um, and I think they can manage the changes adapting to the, to the needs going into the future. And it, it really needs, it's, it's not something we should be afraid of. We shouldn't, I don't, I, you know, we're, we're going to have to have more housing it, it whether it be rental 
or um, cheaper homes. You know, we, you've got to let the market, the market will build what it what is needed, but you got to, there needs to be some outreach, I think, from the city. And that could take on, you know, take many forms. It, what's interesting about what you said is that every, every, every city in the country that has any, that has 50,000 people in it has this conversation about the missing middle. And as a guy who travels around from other markets in the Southeast, I was in Memphis meeting with their planning and zoning director. And I just asked them all the same questions because I sit as an elected official and I like to ask the same types of questions I get asked all the time to somebody where I don't have a predetermined outcome. And he's, I swear to you, the conversation with Paul, the um, public or the community development guy in Memphis, in Memphis, goes, our biggest problem with housing is the missing middle. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> well, it's really funny because if anybody's been to Memphis, it it does not have a ton of really nice parts of town. No, it's it's it seems like it's all. Yeah, it it, it seems it, 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 it doesn't seem some, like it's missing. It's it, it has some challenges. Yep. And I thought it is so interesting. And he goes, "Well, these are the different because I'm we're looking to take down property in certain parts." And he goes, "Well, parts A, B, and C could use a real shot in the arm." Um, you know, your access to fiber here is good. If you're going to build a data center, it's going to attract even more fiber. And he goes, and we really want to work on the missing middle over there. And I didn't, that was when I had to step back and be like, talk to me about what you just said, because I'm going to switch hats and I just want to hear you say it. And that's a, you know, it's a guy whose politics are very different than mine. But I think every big, every city with any sort of scale is sitting here having this conversation about attainable housing. And to me, that's something that nobody fundamentally disagrees with. I do. Just I, not in my backyard. Just not in my backyard. And and the truth is, is that I don't think one or I, I don't think two bedroom townhomes in an area with a bunch of townhomes does anything to the $900,000 townhomes. They're different buyers. They're, you know, the guy who retires at 65 and doesn't want to cut grass anymore and wants to be able to lock and leave is probably not going to live in a two bedroom townhome coming from his $700,000 house on an acre. You know, yep. they're, they're different, they're different buyers. And I think that you can attract that even though you can't legislate it one way or the other. And I, what's really interesting is to hear the conversation and everybody, you know, in, in the movie My Fellow Americans, <laughs> there's a line that's set where uh, Jack Lemmon says, uh, the voice of America, he goes, there are a bunch of people who disagree on absolutely everything and want lower taxes. Uh, and he goes, there's no such thing. And I s sit here and think, I think it's great to have attainable housing or affordable housing in Forsyth County or Milton Cherokee or, or Cherokee or... Yep. Or, but why does it have to be here? And it was like, because those people look at it and say, well, we, these are all great things, but we'll just, Alpharetta can fix that. Uh, and so well, it moves. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I'll tell you my, I've been here a long time, not as long as some of the, you know, obviously there's a lot of people that have been here longer than I, but what, what I tell people when they ask me about Alpharetta and how successful the city has been and managing the growth and, and how well it has grown and what a large commercial commercial tax base it's, we have. It's in growing. And the great schools. And a big, a huge part of that is because the city has for a very long time hired professional, um, hired professionals into positions that where, where you need a professional, whether it be a community relations person or a, 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 the right police chief mm -hmm. or a, a city manager, they've always hired their pros. Pros. And, and on top of that, then they let them do their job. They don't, they don't meddle with it. There's another, there's another city around here that has not allowed, has not allowed their professionals to do their jobs and it and it doesn't work very well i'm not are you, talk, are you talking about ball ground oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but but here's what i would say here's what i would say look 
you know, the proof is in the pudding. If you look at if you look at where we are today, I think overall Alpharetta is an amazing any way you look at it, it's an amazing shape, an amazing condition. Yeah, the traffic is a little bit heavy, but you know, that's 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 just a fact of life. Well, and the highest grade anyone could ever give a city on anything is an A minus because there's always something to complain yeah, about. Yeah, but but here's the thing: I would say to the people that are afraid of density, if you look look at how well the city has managed the growth for the last 25 years, and I think it's reasonable to have faith in the city and the administrators yeah. to oh, continue. Yeah making prudent, reasonable decisions, including decisions when it's appropriate for density. Well, and I looked at that that application that came a couple weeks ago um, and that and it didn't pass is that they were looking to go from 42 condos to 62 townhomes. And I don't dispute that it was a better financial situation for the developer because I'm sure that had Higher some density is always going to be better. Of course it is. It, but I would rather, and this is just me, I would rather take that gamble on 62 units than 362 units. Because if you're telling me that I, I have the ability to see how it does, as, as somebody who's going to sit here and evaluate it, I go walking down this road that you and I both agree uh, needs to be walked down in some fashion, and th there are a million different ways to get there, and nobody's entirely right and nobody's entirely wrong. I would rather make a 62-unit bet and be wrong. Incremental incremental steps in the direction that sh should lead to more affordable housing is, is prudent. I think, what do you, I know you follow uh, the, the news here, uh, pretty extensively, and I'll, I'll, with, I'll withhold. I, I literally ask, but North Point Mall in that area is about to see a tremendous opportunity. What do you see that coming down? I think that there's the opportunity to do exactly what you've been talking about. There, I just wanted to hear, without me weighing in on it, I want to hear what you what you think and what you think people want to see. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and repeat what, what I already feel. Um, I've been here long enough to see what happened to Gwinnett Mall. I lived and, over and, there. And it became a slum. And it's it's obvious that we need to work with North Point Mall to make sure it stays um, um, vibrant and, it, and it, it remains viable. And this city has the right administrators and the right professionals in place to make the decisions that are going to work. And you, you, I, I, I'm call me naive, but I, I have a great faith in, in people The you know, when people are, are honest and educated and uh, trained in, in their fields and in city government and administration of, of, of cities, um, we're blessed with people like that in our city government. Um, I, I think if they decide it should be mixed use, they're, they're, they turn them all into. I've just heard bits and pieces that it's. Um, re, it'll become. Um, there'll be a residential component. There, there will maybe be offices. Um, I've yet to see the city of Alpharetta screw up in a something badly yeah. in, man, <laughs> in managing the growth. Right. They, I mean, they're batting. They're they're getting far more decisions right than they are wrong. Oh, so not even close. I don't know what the mall, I don't know what North Point Mall needs, but I'm 95 percent confident that the city is going to make the right decision without knowing what that decision is. There, all we have to do is look at our track record and look at where we are now, and have faith that what worked in the past is going to continue working in the future. The past is the best predictor of the future. And it doesn't matter if it's me or. Jim or David Belisle or Mike Kennedy or Chuck Martin, you've seen all of those people are intelligent, pretty well decision makers that lean on their professional staff. It's what sets this community apart. Sure it is. 
in a million ways because I sit on a board of directors and I have ideas and things that I want to try to accomplish. But they're smart enough to tell me, please don't do this. Please don't say that in public. Like I and I, you know, I'm a guy who's maybe a little bit younger. I'll put a little bit more out there. I'm not necessarily afraid to make a mistake because I feel like people value the authenticity. Um, and I own when I do something stupid, I, you know, I'll, I'll own it. To it. Nope. <laughs> yeah. nope. I'm still waiting. And that's what, uh, you know, and Pat is really good about calling me and asking me. I said, you know what, man, sometimes you just want things back here or there. And it's like, that's fair. But, you know, I'd, I'd rather someone step up and, and, and say what they believe to be true. And even, even when it's not necessarily a popular, uh, a popular side of a, of a question, but if it's what you believe, um, I, I, we see too much of people, um, making their decisions by what, what way they perceive the wind blowing well, as it, opposed to what they think is the right decision. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll stop it here. I've got one more question for you with app and media, five year five year plan, you and Hans are behind closed doors, like, uh, Mr. Burns on the Simpsons. What do you, uh, what do you, where do you guys think is, is the, is the future of local news? What do you think, uh, how do you think that you've got as much experience here as anybody? Um, what do you see? What do you see changing? Where do you see it going? And you, you can reserve the right to be totally wrong. Yep. The demand for what the demand for local news has not, not diminished 1% in the last 20 years. So what our core product is, is that that demand is not going anywhere. It's, it's, I think it's, it has been constant and it's going to remain constant. What changes is the business model that, um, enables us to operate at a profit and continue to deliver the local news that people want. Um, you know, Hans has started the podcast network. Um, I think that it's 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 the fastest growing media they say on the planet. I couldn't believe that I was the only person to take them up on. I I, I was know, like, yeah, sure. It it, may, it <laughs> makes sense for a, for a million different reasons that that I mean. People are more and more time starved and podcasts give you pieces of information that you want typically pretty quickly. So anyway, um, it, I, I see us continuing to to cover and produce local news. The way we disseminate it is probably going to change. Um, and if I, you know, if I if I actually knew how that would be in five years, I'd you'd bet now I would I would be so wealthy it wouldn't even be funny it, who knows well ray you're a gentleman and a scholar i want to thank you for coming on today you guys have provided me with a really gracious opportunity to get to know an awful lot of my constituents if nothing else when they see that i'm on the losing end of a 6-1 vote they can be like hey he's not all bad he asks good questions and he can talk to a wall um but i appreciate your attitude i appreciate the way you guys do business here and I, you know, I think that there's a lot as as somebody who gives the the paper here plenty of opportunity to take shots at me. You guys we, are, are more than fair. We we <laughs> we try to be fair. Thanks, Ben, and and I thank you for letting me come on your show and not and not beating me up too bad. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's uh, I, I say that for Hans. Uh, well. <laughs> I appreciate it, Ray. We'll tune in next week to another uh, rendition of the Ben Burnett Show on the Appen Media Podcast Network. Thank you. Thank you.